Um, the next part of our program is going to follow very much on what Leisha Eve has said, and I'm going to ask the panelists to come up. But before I do that, I'd like to introduce, though she's not going to speak yet, um, our luncheon speaker, I, I see over there, Daniel Feinberg um, from Pixar Animation Studios. So, so we're going to have a, a fabulous um, um, second half. But before that, um, we're still working on our first half. So please come down. And I'm going to ask Judith Chef to come up to the podium and, uh, and invite our panelists who are going to talk a little bit about um, what women are doing to create breakthrough solutions to what sometimes is called big X problems, that is, big, large uh, social problems that affect all of us in the world. Um, so, uh, Judith, would you come up and please introduce your panel? And please come down, get some coffee, but then please come down and uh, our panel is going to come up over here. Thank you, Nancy. While the panelists are making their way up to the panel part, I first of all really want to thank Nancy for her leadership in pulling together this conference. She and I started talking about this about a year ago, and we said we really need to do something to celebrate the 20th anniversary of the Women's Center, and Nancy has just been phenomenal in terms of being able to pull that together. And additionally, I really also would like to thank the senior leadership of NJIT for helping to create such a great and supportive culture and climate for women that we have here at NJIT. So what we're going to talk about in this next panel, and I know some of our panelists I think are hovering around over there, and I'd like them to move over to the panel piece of the, of the stage, is big X problems. So I'm a mathematician, and I think we all know what it means, you know, what X is. X is that variable. And so when I was, uh, you know, teaching math at the University of Illinois, you know, we would tell people, we would have students solve for x. You had that equation and you were trying to solve for x. Well, a couple of years ago, Google came up with this notion of big x problems, which are giant problems that we face within society. And what are some of those big x problems that we're challenged with today? And if you go onto the internet and you do a search, you'll find it's things like hunger, water, Peace. Chandra, you can come on up front because you're on this panel. I see her collecting her, her items. But it's things like water, hunger, peace, income inequality, gender, health. It's creating an environment which is going to be something that we can all appreciate and live in. And what we're going to have our panelists talk about is some of the amazing things that women are doing to solve these big X problems. And while they're still getting them, them themselves organized, I want to mention the one company that uh, Lisa Eve talked about, the company Web Team that's working on the, to on the curriculum for autistic children. Part of the project that they worked on was coordinating with a team of undergraduate students from NJIT that were part of the Honors College, and that team of students that was working on a toy for autistic children, actually the team of three had two women as part of it, Amira Sigler and Livia Koralkawa. So we had two women out of a team of three that were working on the project that Web Team ultimately got the funding from Verizon to work on. And so today, as I said, this panel is going to talk about solving problems, big X problems that we have. And I'm going to ask each of the panelists to spend a few minutes talking about what they're doing, what their problem is, and then we'll have some cross-conversation between them. There's a uh, handout in your folder, and so the people on the panel are, Nic are Nicole Bryan, who is a great colleague of ours from Montclair State University, and there's some phenomenal programs that we collaborate on with Montclair State. They do a lot in the area of entrepreneurship, and Nicole is a great supporter of ours. Janisha Patel, who's an NJIT student from the Computing Sciences Department. Jeanette Duffy, who's man... All right. Thank you. Jeanette Duffy, who is from UNICEF, the U.S. Fund for UNICEF. Emily Reed, who works with Girls Who Code and Chandri Barrett, who's the co-founder of the Barrett Foundation. And now I'd like to ask Nicole to talk a little bit about things that she's doing. 
Um, thank you. Um, thank you all for being here, and, and special thanks to NJIT, to Judith and Nancy for um, the invitation and for also collaborating together on this. Um, so I was asked as part of this panel to talk a little bit about what is Big X and uh, why is that important and what are breakthrough solutions. Um, so my area of work is explicitly interdisciplinary, I'm focused on a lot of humanitarian challenges, um, peace and war related conflict transformation, um, child labor, forced labor, human trafficking, the kind of issues that um, really can't be solved in an hour and the kind of issues that we haven't necessarily been fully on the same page in terms of how to even identify them and how to define the problems. Um, and one of the reasons that the particular topic of today, women as being part of creating solutions, is so vital to the really big challenges um, is in part because women are disproportionately affected by the, these problems, by problems like access to water, um, the climate change problems and the catastrophic effects that result from them, um, but also why it's critical and why we're at such a relevant point in our history is that uh, women are now uh, becoming included and uh, transforming the conversation and the way in which we think about those problems and we, the way in which we think about the opportunities. So. Um, from the perspective of technology and from the perspective of those who are working in the private sector on creating solutions, um, uh, let's say a, a light bulb has sort of gone off and is, and is caught on in the sense that um, to really innovate, to really understand how to make breakthrough and how to, how to solve the tough stuff, um, women need to be part of this. Not because they're women as women, but because they're women with unique experiences, with unique perspectives that are critical for understanding the root causes and the different iterations, as well as the opportunities for um, creating solutions that will last, that are sustainable and that are not ad hoc. Uh, some of the ways that this has been um, encouraging um, it are the ways in which, for example, uh, Janisha, who's sitting next to me, we were part of some events uh, recently involving women's empowerment and United Nations developments of women empowerment principles, United Nations Global Compact, which is focused on the private sector and has nearly 1,000 private sector entities signed up specifically to um, address and to build into their programs the idea of women empowerment. So these are encouraging opportunities and ways in which we can engage. From the perspective of business and strategy, it really has become less of a sort of charity and less of something nice to do to get points on a report card, but rather something that's critical for competitive advantage. And a lot of times when we engage with uh, the private sector, it's realized that in order to be competitive, one needs to think about problems in a different way and to think about solutions in a different way. And that different way very often means including people who haven't been on the table from the perspective of innovation who have not been part of the conversation on innovating. And that's what's so encouraging. Now, it's encouraging, but it doesn't mean it's easy to do. It doesn't mean it's easy to do because we don't necessarily have the platform. We don't necessarily have the mechanism for bringing people together. There are women who are in indigenous communities in the United States and around the world who we would not meet on an everyday basis. How do we reach them? How do they reach us? Where is the place in which we can engage? Using what language? On which platform? And what's exciting about being in this room is, is the opportunity to be part of creating the platform realizing that we've identified who's missing from the conversation, girls and women. We've identified why they're missing, why we're missing, and why we need to be part of the conversation, but how do we get there? And the importance of having public-private partnerships uh, contributes to this because we realize that having governments and having multinational corporations and small businesses and universities pay attention to this, gives credibility and legitimacy. So the timing for 
accelerating uh, women's empowerment through big X problems is really critical now. Uh, but what we also need to do is realize our unique privilege and opportunity to be part of that as this room has been uh, shaped by people before us, we're shaping the next room. So what are we doing here in this room to make sure that these seats are exponentially tripled, doubled um, in many different ways uh, for the next generation? What I'm proud to be part of is some initiatives that have been sponsored by, for example, Microsoft looking at technology and human trafficking, trying to understand what are the ways in which a technology company might uh, indirectly contribute to human trafficking and what are the ways in which it can address that. And when I talk about this research, very often people get confused. Well, why is Microsoft looking at human trafficking and what, what is, I don't understand, right? That's very often I don't understand. And then in some cases people think, okay, this is part of the corporate responsibility. And in other cases, people think, well, um, this is uh, something as part of sort of diversity and inclusion because we like to categorize and box and silo things. In, in the case of the folks that I'm working with, this is their research. This is the research group, and they're specifically thinking human trafficking is a pretty tough problem. And in order for us as our identity to be innovative and to encourage innovation, we need to take on some of the tough problems and we need to think about how to solve them. And so in addressing the tough problems like human trafficking, like um, antivirus for uh, HIV AIDS, et cetera, these kinds of initiatives are also honing in on ramping up innovation and including women as part of the problem solving and solutions is also essentially a, a major competitive advantage. So that's how it's perceived. It's not perceived as charity and it's not perceived as philanthropy. It's actually perceived as smart for innovation. So um, in, in this way, we might want to be open as we think about changing the conversation to the different boxes within which we place women as creators uh, of breakthrough solutions and where that falls within our organizations and across. And we also want to be aware of the tendency to um, sometimes inadvertently um, pigeonhole women in different groups. I've worked a lot in peace and conflict, and there's a lot been written in, in the last 25 years on women as peacemakers and the role that women can play in peacemaking. And while that's essential, and it really is a unique role, um, sometimes it can be pigeonholing to some women who wonder, well, why do we have to be the peacemakers? And is that now somehow pigeonholing our identity? So just as much as we want to be aware of women's participation, we also want to be aware of the different ways in which that itself can contribute to a new kind of marginalizing. It happens to be that where we are in, in the world today um, is that if we don't work together to solve big problems, we won't have a world. So that's the reality, and those who are on the cutting edge of trying to solve those problems will also be those who are receiving rewards for that. And that's why including women and, in, and creating platforms for women, diverse women with different experiences, women who are farmers who have no access to electricity, as well as, as women who are living in, in the tallest building in Newark, so that we can all work together to think different ways about how to identify problems and to solve them. So um, I look forward to be part of the conversation with all of you and, and the dialogue session to going into some specifics. Thank you. Thank you, Nicole. And now I'd like to ask Janisha Patel, who is a student from the NJIT College of Computing Sciences, to talk a little bit about some of the work that she has been doing. Hi, guys. Uh, I'm supposed to push this, and I forgot that. Um, I want to start off with a quote that I heard at the UN by Hillary Clinton. She said that women's rights are human rights and human rights are women's rights. And you know, a lot of times we don't think of that, but you know, her saying that made, I, I don't know, it just empowered me in a way that I was never empowered before. Um, I never really viewed you know, women's rights as human rights till she said it in, in that tone with the confidence and you know, um, with the self-esteem power that she had. And um, you know, that changed my life uh, within that 10 seconds. Um, 
For uh, Big X problems, I think it's the way we perceive women in the industry and also in our households. Um, you know, um, we actually did a study in one of my internships. Uh, it was an unofficial study where we, uh, every meeting we went to, we saw how women were perceived and how their opinions were taken. And what we found was after being in 10 meetings, women were the ones that were interrupted the most. And not only interrupted, they were not, you know, like they were not allowed to finish their thought because it was never con considered. And um, I really think that's a big problem. Uh, we are missing this huge perspective. Um, we are, in, in, in a way, creators. We create civilization. And, you know, for the civilization to run in a way uh, that women perceive it is so important because when you educate a woman, you don't only educate her, but you educate a whole family. And, uh, you know, a lot of times that's been not perceived well. Um, you know, a lot of things that we do around NJIT, um, we have an ACMW chapter that we started this year. Uh, we thought that was really important to have because sometimes you only need one woman to, you know, stand up on the stage or stand up for you and say, hey, if I can do it, you can too. And I think that's a really, really important power that all of us in this room hold, whether you're a man or a female. You are a role model to someone that you might not even know, um, especially coming from a student. A lot of my faculty and staff at NJIT have been, you know, great help. And, you know, I might not say it, but they're all role models to me because they allow me to continue forward. And um, this aspect of role models and mentors are so important when um, students like me are in high school or college because I wouldn't be exposed to technology without that. Um, I also um, am a volunteer um, instructor for Girls Who Code here at Newark La uh, Public Library. And what I noticed was these girls, they're just waiting to know about technology. They're not taught that in school. You're taught what biology is. You're taught what, uh, you know, geography is. And, you know, in, in some way, you can go be a doctor. You can, be, you can go be a lawyer. You can go be an accountant. But you don't really know what technology is. Um, some of the high schools um, that I have been doing research on are actually teaching computer science as Microsoft Office products. And that's a big problem <laughs> because that's not what technology is. Um, to me, technology is the way one can express herself. It's sort of like creative writing. It's a language where you can write something and you can change the world. It has one language that everyone can use. And you know, you can think about Facebook, think about Twitter. Facebook started in a dorm room, just like the one that I live in right now. And look at the way it's empowering the world. We share things, we talk about social issues that we would never talk about or even know about if we didn't turn on our news. Uh, didn't turn on our TV or read our newspapers. So technology is a platform where women can come in and change the world. And you know, I'm really waiting for that to happen. We are doing that, but not enough. And I really want to go into the workforce. I want to see you know the enrollment of computer science go from 18% that's right now to you know 50% because we need that. Um, you know, I grew up in India, so uh, my family was a very um, you know, um, sexist in a way, and that was a big problem for me because I am not, you know, I'm a super feminist ever since I was little because I was born and raised by uh, a single mother. So, you know, people would always tell me, you know, oh, maybe she's doing this because she doesn't, you know, have a dad or, you know, it's because her, mo because her mom's raising her alone. But, you know, just by standing here, I think I feel so happy because I never thought I would be here because everyone told me otherwise and that's a problem you know when we look into our families a lot of times when you know your remote control doesn't work or you know your lamp broken or someone wants to fix a bulb we always say hey honey can you please fix this we never really go to our you know daughters we never really try to fix it ourselves and you know that's somewhere we can also start making a change we can start you know going to um, the females um, I know I saw actually I saw a commercial, uh, it was from Verizon, I believe, and it was about this little girl um, that, you know, she was exploring the world, which is what we're supposed to do. She was going out in the mountains, trying out rocks. She was, you know, drilling something with her, um, with her brother. And, you know, you would constantly hear parents saying, oh, you're too pretty for that. You're going to mess up your dress. And I was like, oh, forget the dress. <laughs> I want to drill. <laughs> Um, when I was young, I saw all these products being made and I was like, wow, I can really do this differently and way better. And I think that's where we come in because we can put this touch that's never really been in the products and the technology that we see today. And, you know, the, the face of technology can change just by the participation of women like us. So, you know, I 
my initiative for all of you is to, you know, uh, be a role model, <laughs> be a mentor, and even in your households, talk to, you know, your, uh, your girls, get them involved in Girls Who Code, um, get them involved in National Center of Women in Information Technology. Um, there are so many websites. The best thing about technology is you can learn, use technology to learn technology. Um, I did the same, so I know you all can do so too. And uh, you can even go on code.org and teach your two-year-old how to program with Elsa from Frozen. Mm -hmm. So you can see how far technology is and how easy it is to learn it. We just need that initiative, that push for women to learn it. And for all you men, you, we need you more. We need you to tell us, we need you to be mentors, to tell us how we can change your groups, how we can change your company, and your support can make us reach, you know, things that we've never even been reached before. Thank, thank you, Janisha. We've heard quite a bit about Girls Who Code and the Girls Who Code program, and I'd like to ask Emily Reed, who is the curriculum director at Girls Who Code, to talk a little bit about that initiative, because that is a tool that is really going to help empower a whole generation of young people. Okay, thank you. Um, hi, everyone. Um, like I said, I'm Emily Reed from Girls Who Code. Um, I am a computer scientist and engineer by training, um, but I've also been an educator for a long time. Um, I'm really excited to see all the <laughs> involvement with Girls Who Code already today. And actually, the companies of our um, two keynote speakers today, Pixar and Verizon, sponsor our summer immersion programs, which are a seven-week program for girls to learn computer science. So um, we're very grateful to them for that. Um, I actually got involved with Girls Who Code originally by um, teaching our summer immersion program in Miami, which was sponsored by Verizon Terramark, and I don't know if Felicia's still here, but uh, Judith Spitz and Rose Kirk and some of the women she mentioned came to speak to our girls and were incredible role models and mentors to them um, and were incredibly inspiring. So um, that, that piece is extremely important, and I'm glad we're talking a lot about that today. Um, so at Girls Who Code, uh, we have two main programs, our summer immersion program that I mentioned and our clubs program, which it sounds like is what um, Tanisha uh, volunteers at, which is fantastic. Um, so there are a number of aspects of this program that have been very successful in teaching girls to code and um, expanding computer science education within their own communities. because. I think there are a number of important things that, that we've found that are takeaways, um, for, that are uh, helpful takeaways for things that you all have done and are already working on. Um, so it's part of a large conversation that I'm glad that we're continuing. So we believe from what we've seen that girls bring a unique perspective to whatever they're creating. And our, the underlining part of our curriculum is that we are trying to teach girls how to use computer science to solve any kind of problem that they're interested in. So the way that we do this is through two, fac two main factors in our curriculum. One is through focusing on computational thinking, and the other is having a completely project-based curriculum. So the reason why we focus on computational thinking, that means we really emphasize those underlying concepts, such as for the coders out there, for focusing on loops and conditionals and functions and understanding all of that, that deep underlying logic um, before focusing on specific languages. Because we all know that the popular language of the time is going to change, right? Like years ago is more C++ and Java, and everyone's learning Python and JavaScript, and in a couple of years it's going to be something completely different. But we're trying to give them the skills so that they are, they are prepared for success as the as the technologies of choice continue, as technologies of choice change, as what they're interested in changes, so that they can have a really solid logical foundation. The other part of our curriculum that's very important is that everything is completely project based. So the reason why we do this is we want the girls to be very creative with what they're building in the classroom so that they can inject a lot of their own creativity and their own vision into what's being done. Um, we've talked a little bit today about um, how to combine technology with other areas that students are interested in and also combining with, say, like art and design. Um, so we want to show girls that computer science is not just 
sitting in a dark room writing code with like nothing going on around you and eating a bag of chips and some seven up or something. Right? We want to show them that whatever their their fantastic vision is, that that's something that they they're empowered to visualize and create and manifest through computer science. Um, so that's that's on the skills side. We really try to give these girls not just exposure to computer science, but real hard skills. So that then when they walk out of our programs, they can actually say, I created something. They can walk out with a web application or um, a game that, that is showing something important in their community or is solving an interesting social problem. They can walk out and share that game or that app or whatever that creation is with their family and with their friends um, so that they can teach them about technology as well. Um, a few other important aspects of our program that we've already touched on a bit today, but I think are important to underscore, um, are, is focusing on mentorship um, and role models. So we have a number of speakers who come in to show girls what, they, what else they can do in computer science and in technology, so that we're exposing them to a number of areas, um, no matter what their interests are. And that mentorship piece is really huge. You know, Jason talked about that. In my experience, that was really crucial in continuing when I first ex experienced imposter syndrome um, in my intro to computer science classroom. That is really, really important. Um, and it's also important, as we mentioned, um, for male allies to step up to that. So um, women are really important role models, and we all need to be out there. I think all women need to be out there showing other girls what they're, what they're doing and sharing their experience. Because when we look up to someone and see, uh, what we say at Girls Who Code is you can't be what you can't see. So if you're looking um, up to someone and you can see, oh, I identify with them in some way. They're like me in some way, or they come from the same background as me. They're much more likely to feel empowered and confident in their own technical ability. Um, but male allies are very important in this conversation. Um, it's a crucial part of changing, um, changing this huge gender gap that's existed for a very long time and is going in the wrong direction. And the only way that we can do it is together. Um, the other important part of our, of our summer immersion experience that I think has been very successful and is growing for our club's experience is a continuing ongoing support network. So I think for, um, if you're not involved with Girls Who Code, I'd love you to be. But um, for the, all the organizations that you're involved with, I think this is something to think about, and it's, it's an example of just what we're doing here, is continuing that support and conversation. Um, so I'll give you a, a fun example. We have a Facebook group for some of our Summer Immersion Program alumni, and they use it to support each other. They'll say things like, oh, you know, I have, I'm in, I'm in college now, I'm in my first weed out computer science class, like anyone else having this problem. Or, you know, the president of my robotics club is kind of being a bully to me and not letting me use the 3D printer. What should I do? <laughs> <laughs> Things like that. Um, and they're sharing hackathons and scholarship ideas with each other. So they're, they're power to, they're very empowered to support each other. And I think that's a really incredible thing. Um, we also see that these girls come up with just fantastic technical creations once they have the skills and the confidence to do whatever they want. So we've seen a number of really fascinating final projects that the girls work on. For example, um, actually in my classroom last year, the, um, there was a group of four girls created a project called Thermalert. They used an Arduino device um, and they put it underneath a car seat and it had a temperature and a pressure sensor. So it sent an emergency text message to a parent if their child was in the car seat and the car was overheating. They had heard a number of those, it was during last summer, and there were a number of those really unfortunate stories, and they said, this is a problem, and how can we use technology to solve it, right? So I have a number of other examples like that that I could share, but they're using this technology in really creative ways to solve things that they're extremely passionate about. Um, another statistic that was very exciting about some of our work and I think echoing the point about, um, you know, when you, when you teach someone to code, they'll teach someone else. We have 92% of our girls after the program teach another girl how to code. And that's an incredibly powerful statistic. And it's partially, you know, there, I think that there's unique things that we're doing that are helping that. But, but it really goes to show that these girls are a powerful force. And I think not just women, but young girls 
are really, really powerful in making this change happen. Um, and so I think that empowering them to go into their communities to say, um, oh, I want to teach my friend how to code, or I'm going to teach my little sister how to code. That's in an incredibly powerful force for exposure. Um, so I think the, bo the bottom line for me um, in solving big X problems is that the only way that we can create these innovative solutions and identify problems that need to be solved and identify those incredible solutions for them is to get women at the table and to get girls at the table. And we need to do that through giving them real skills, giving them the confidence they need to complete those skills, and showing them how creative they can be with technology. Thanks. I had the opportunity to meet Jeanette Duffy about six weeks ago at a New Jersey Technology Council uh, program that I was at. And when you hear what she has been doing and really how they've been able to bring together youth from really two parts of the world to solve some problems, I think you're going to find it's really an amazing way to help children help solve some of the big problems. Jeanette is the uh, youth engagement expert specializing in health and nutrition campaigns with UNICEF. Jeanette. Hi, everyone. So yeah, a bit of background on where I come from. I work at the US Fund for UNICEF. And that is slightly different from UNICEF. UNICEF works in 190 different countries, bringing aid to children in times of disaster and just overall anything they need to grow up happy and healthy. And there are 36 national committees that are working in countries that, for the most part, are fortunate enough to not need UNICEF's help. And the US Fund for UNICEF is one of them. And what we do is we raise advocacy, awareness, uh, we fundraise, and we educate everyone about the great work that UNICEF is doing. And I work in particular at the US Fund with UNICEF Ventures. And our job is basically to work like a little startup in this big nonprofit environment, which can be a challenge sometimes, but um, it's good because it allows us to be bringing some technology solutions to the work that we're trying to do to educate people across the United States about UNICEF and in turn be helping some of UNICEF's problems. So um, I'd love to speak to some of the big X problems. I think. Janisha did such an excellent job of setting the stage as to why it needs to be women. I'm going to go home and thank my mother for making me program my VCR when I was eight. Um, but I will give some context to those big X problems by describing the work that we are doing now. Uh, just this month in March, in three different cities, in New York, in Boston, and Dallas, we launched what is the US Fund's latest venture, and it's called UNICEF Kid Power. And we are billing it as the world's first wearable for good. Uh, this is the wearable right here. Mm -hmm. So as we speak, 11,000 children in third through fifth grade across those three cities are all wearing these kid power bands. And they are basically pedometers that are monitoring their activity. And the more active they are, the more points they earn. We're asking them to each earn five kid power points a day. And no coincidence, those five kid power points equal 12,000 steps, which is what the CDC says is the recommended level of physical activity for kids. And once they reach that goal of five kid power points a day, they are earning one of these. This is a packet of ready-to-use therapeutic food. And this is part of the treatment that's given to the 17 million children around the world that are severely malnourished. So the more children here are getting active, they know that they're literally saving lives with every step that they take. It's kind of a stealth intervention there. We're not wagging the fingers at them, telling to get off the couch. But we're seeing that children intrinsically are motivated to help their peers. Young people want to be helpful, and young people connect with children around the world. And so we're realizing that it's a great way to tap in while they're young and give them kind of this lesson in global citizenship and realize that they have the power to help children all around the world too. Um, so this has been very exciting for us. Our, our longest cause platform is Trick or Treat for UNICEF. Some of you may have heard of it. It's uh, over 65 years old now. So we always have had this model of uh, youth helping youth. Um, but this is the first time we've adapted it for the 21st century and had a technological spin on it. And um, from our perspective, I think that's helping to tackle some of these big X problems that this panel is discussing in two ways. And one of them is we heard our keynote speaker speak to the fact that, you know, women are underrepresented in technology fields professionally. 
um, women are not underrepresented in fields like the nonprofit industry. And I think especially what the nonprofit industry is realizing is that there's really no boundaries anymore between what's a technology field and what's not. Every field needs to be adapting technology to get ahead. And more specifically, every field needs to be thinking how technology fields think. Um, I said that my department functions like a little startup within a huge nonprofit. And let me tell you, that can be quite challenging when everyone else hasn't quite adopted your way of thinking. But um, we try to think quickly. We try to think on our feet. Um, we try to iterate very rapidly, which is certainly what we've done with Kid Power. And even just adapting that way of thinking uh, is helpful for anyone in any field. And adapting things that are technologi technologically driven, um, but still can be solutions for the problems that you are looking to solve, can be incredibly helpful and really is what everyone needs to be doing. Um, the big problem number two that I think we're solving is democratizing technology and starting at a very young age and also helping teachers. Um, so it's obviously not specifically girls when we are bringing this program to classrooms, but we are reaching young girls as well. And with our subsidized school program, we target Title I schools. We target classrooms that likely otherwise wouldn't have technology in the classroom. And a lot of times this is also because teachers have tons of tests to worry about. I can now tell you every standardized test coming up in the states of Massachusetts, New York, and Texas in the next month just because when we brought this program, we were made very aware there are tests. So, by introducing this technology to classrooms that need it the most, kids are getting it early and teachers are getting it packaged in a way where they don't really have to worry about it. We give uh, full instruction, we give full curriculum so that this comes kind of a plug and play experience for kids. And this is one of the very first wearables on the market that's targeted specifically for kids. The kids that we have seen, these 11,000 in Title I schools, very often, this is one of the first pieces of technology they have ever owned for themselves. Um, you know, even now, a lot of underserved populations are adopting smartphones, but a lot of households still don't have computers. And if they're not exposed to this technology when they're young, and I know this is something Emily can relate to, they're already going to be behind. You know, now we're seeing that we need to adopt technology into every field, nonprofit or not, but that's just going to amplify over the next 10, 20 years when these kids are entering the workforce and when they're going to school and choosing their majors. So, by getting there early, um, we're hoping to give them an awareness, give them an appreciation, and give them an understanding, um, and give them a feeling of empowerment that it's technology that they know how to use. It's easy, it's intimidating, it's not intimidating, and it's not something hands off like mom's smartphone or the computer might be. And this has helped us solve what is the US fund for UNICEF's big X problem, which is coincidentally a big X problem for women around the world, which is malnutrition. Um, we're just putting these bands on kids and our sponsors who are the ones that are providing the funding that converts the points to packets just love this idea of kids helping kids and it's allowed us for the first time to have a domestic agenda and it has paved the way I think for UNICEF um, across the world because we have other national committee offices that are interested in this as well to really think through how technology can for the first time be something that is helping us reach our constituents and raise the funds and awareness that we need instead of kind of sticking to some of those more old-fashioned you know on TV commercials that you see asking for money. I hope this doesn't get back to anyone at my organization because we do make some very good ones, but um, we, need to, we need to keep up and realize that this is the way that we're gonna be reaching our constituents and realize that other fields outside of technology where women are the majority do need to be adopting and realizing and um, coming up to speed with that way of thinking really being relevant. Um, and that's it. I look forward to hearing the rest of my panelists and answering the questions. Our last speaker this morning on the panel is Chandri Barrett, and hopefully you'll get a chance to see the wonderful artwork that they have brought as one of their examples out in the lobby during, during the break. She has founded the Barrett Foundation, and they bring art education modules into improving citizenship and peace activities. Chandri? Well, I really want to thank you, Judith, for inviting me here. I'm, I'm so honored and so excited to be here. Um, we are arts educators. Uh, we have a byline, which is public art by the public. Our goal is to celebrate local, diverse cultures through art. 
We've worked with thousands of underserved children in Newark, creating art, mostly our animodule sculptures. This is, we have one outside. This is what one looks like. Uh, these are art pieces created by artists working with youth. Uh, there are about 50 of them around the city now. We were recently invited by the Port Authority of New York, New Jersey to have an installation of a dozen of these sculptures at international arrivals at the Newark Airport, currently greeting 500,000 visitors to our city each year. So when people come into Newark, they can see the color and the excitement and the potential of the children of the city. Uh, we like to talk about changing the conversation. And the big X problem that we are dealing with on a daily basis is peace. Um, I hope some of you, if not all of you, are familiar with our peace mural, which is on Broad Street and Lincoln Park. Uh, that was painted to greet the Dalai Lama and the International Peace Summit. That mural was painted by 500 children in 14 schools. That's essentially our model, is to bring art into the community, to exalt the community, to promote local cultures, to promote diversity. We have found over and over again that disengaged youth is angry youth. Angry youth is not peaceful youth. This doesn't create peace in the home or in the community or in the city or in the world. We found over and over again by giving voice to underserved people, people who are usually excluded from the general cultural conversation. If you look around the city and you go to Military Park in these beautiful places we have in our city, look at the statuary and see who it's representing and see if it looks like you. So for us to promote local culture, to promote diversity, is wh what we do. We started our foundation 18 years ago with a summer French language art and culture immersion program in the south of France. And we saw what could happen in a month of exposing children from very different socioeconomic backgrounds to art and culture. And we brought that knowledge back to Newark to make it year round to work with thousands of children rather than handfuls of children, which are the groups that we handle in France. And that program is still alive and well. That program has taken 50 students from Newark, most of whom were on a plane for the first time, to France for a month to work with very dedicated French artists to learn how to express themselves. 100% uh, of those students have gone on to college and if you're familiar with the statistics in Newark, that's a miracle statistic. Uh, we, have a, we have a major announcement here today because we have these sculptures made by community. And they're all over the city. They're in East Side High and West Side High and Central High and Vocational High and, and of course, at the airport. Now we have, with our partner and associate, uh, we have the ability not only to express and promote local culture, but we have a way to connect local culture. We're now integrating NFC technology, which is near field communication, onto our art pieces. And we have a sample, our animodule, in the hallway if you want to play with it. If you have an NFC enabled phone, which is any Android phone, and soon to be Apple phones, you can just click on this piece on the sculpture. And right now, we have it set just to show you the capability of this technology. It goes to our video, our animodule video that currently plays on two screens at the Newark airport. But the implications for combining this interactive technology with this interactive art are almost limitless. It means that, for example, Newark could be the first connected community through art. We can have animodules around the city. We can connect the animodules to small businesses to promote small businesses. We can, prom we can connect it to wherever we want to connect it to. So it's a big step forward for us. It's a big step forward for public art to make it interactive.
because now this public art can speak to you. We have a project looming for, I hope you know that next year is Newark's 350th anniversary. We have a project to put Anna modules all throughout the city with this NFC technology, which will have the Anna module trail, like the Freedom Trail in Boston, for those of you who've traveled to Boston. So we can take people around the city and we can show them what's happening at the Proust Center and we can show them what's happening at the visual, at the Arts Center. And we can connect our city. Our city. So public art by the public, that is now interactive. And the concept of, we'll take it one step further, we do our summer program in France. We have Anna modules at the Newark Airport. So just close your eyes and imagine, now we've got an Anna module in the Marseille Airport. And they can connect. And we can sell Anna module toys. And we can start having a constellation of peacemaking around the world. We will be able to see on our phones where every Anna module in the world is and what students are doing in Gambia and what they're doing in Marseille and what they're doing in Newark. So the concept, the concept is almost limitless. It's tremendously exciting. And I'm just going to give one paid political announcement because I feel a little bit like a spy in this room. <laughs> Please, STEM needs to become STEAM, science, technology, engineering, art, and mathematics. You cannot separate art from technology because what is technology doing? Close your eyes for one minute and try to imagine a world without art without dance, without music, without movies, without Van Gogh. Please open up the conversation to STEAM. Art and design is the same coin. It's the other side of the coin. They are inextricably linked. And women, I have to say, are also tremendously underrepresented in the art world. So we need to open that up as well.